Author Maria Nemeth once said that one of the biggest obstacles to hitting our goals is that we're not as married to the goal as we are married to the plan of how we're going to get there. So as a little cautionary tale as we get into the planning, this should not be something that that constricts us, but it gives us a framework within which to work. Welcome to Tapping Creativity, a podcast for the creative community. Yes, it's a podcast for you. Whether you're looking for insight, inspiration, or community, you found yourself in the right place. My name is Matthew Temple. I am the host. And on this podcast, we go into questions, inspirations, challenges of the creative process. It's about connecting with other artists, hearing what other people are struggling with, their wins, their challenges. If you like what you hear, make sure you subscribe, follow, share. If you really like what you hear, give us a thumbs up or give us some kind of review. And with that, let's hop into this week's episode. Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of Tapping Creativity. If you've been following along over the last few weeks, you know that we are doing a mini segment here of the podcast where we are going through the creative process and what I call the nine P's for powerful and effective creating. Uh, It's been really exciting. It is based on the book that I have written, The Creative's Handbook. If you have a copy of it or want a copy, you can find it at matthewctemple.com slash handbook. But if you don't want to get a copy of it, don't worry. I'm basically going over this entire book and the entire creative process that I developed for myself that I've also spent years either mentoring or consulting with or coaching others, either individual private coaching or even when I was vice president for production and development at Millie Pictures International and I was working with whole teams of creators and writers and directors and some of these pieces were well how do we get from uh, the different stages in the creative process uh, from one to the next. Now, many of the things that we're going to going over here may not be necessarily like the issue you're dealing with. And as you can imagine, when I was in this position at Millie Pictures, like I had Emmy winners and Oscar nominees that I was working with, and their struggles were different. It wasn't like, what am I going to do? I know what I'm doing. I even have a schedule and deadlines that I have to hit because we have d- delivery dates and all this stuff. So that stuff wasn't all. The challenge, the challenges came up in other places. What happens when there's a scene that's really not working? What about the collaboration portion of it? So there are different pieces that would that would come into play, and they're going to come into play at different times. So here we are uh, going through this process. If you're just joining us now, if you go back to the beginning of it, the first week in this mini series was. Uh, an introduction to what we're doing. The second one is what I call the first P of this of the nine P's, and that is purpose. Why finding your why? Why are you doing this? Uh, why is this so important to you to spend your time and perhaps money in developing this project? The second one would be the project. Getting really clear on what that project is. What are you doing? Uh, picking that project and being clear. Uh, and then this week we are going to does it to uh, dive into planning. Uh, planning might seem like a unsexy part of the creative process, but the planning helps begin to just bring additional clarity to what we're doing all the time in my work. I just say clarity, clarity, clarity is so important. It's in the vague, soft edges where disappointment happens because when something just stays in our brain and we don't have a particular plan, anything is possible. But once you begin doing it, some things become more and more impossible. But that's because it's being realized, it's becoming reality. And in reality, a lot of things are just not possible. In our fantasy, in our minds, a lot of times, anything is possible. So um, beginning to kind of really put down how are we going to get through this? And what are some of the healthy steps of getting there? That way we actually do get somewhere. So to kick this week's uh, episode off, I'm going to start with an old adage that comes from the British military, for better or for worse. It's called the seven Ps, and it is proper planning and preparation prevents piss poor performance. Very different from my Ps, um, but nonetheless, in this case and in this context, very, very valuable because 
I have noticed with myself, with many creative people is that we just kind of want to wing it, right? It's like, let's just jump in and, you know, I'm, I'm feeling inspiration. I'm just going to jump in. And that's great because we can't actually predict really what's going to come at us from the future. So why plan it besides it's this, you know, creativity. I don't want to or enclose it. But at the same time, it's planning that helps us deal with the unknown. And particularly if we're not married to that plan, once you become married to a certain plan, then that can take on a life of its own. Like it has to happen this way in order for me to feel good about it. But the plan can can bring a certain confidence. That way we can also deal with the unexpected, which inevitably will come our way. Author Maria Nemeth once said that one of the biggest obstacles to hitting our goals is that we're not as married to the goal as we are married to the plan of how we're going to get there. So as a little cautionary tale as we get into the planning, this should not be something that that constricts us, but it gives us a framework within which to work. You know, whether you are, you know, if you're an artist and say you, uh, you like doing line drawings, well, there are constraints to that. And that the constraints, like you're not doing color or you're not using watercolor washes or, you know, every line is noticed and therefore every line has to be perfect. Those are constraints. But within the constraints, there's actually more possibility for creative exploration than if there were none at all. So, you know, they say that it is great to start out with the end in mind. And I agree, we definitely all need direction. But that doesn't mean that you don't make adjustments because you will. And it also doesn't mean that when you get there, it'll look exactly like you planned because it probably won't. And in fact, if everything goes to plan and what you get at the end is exactly what you had predicted, then that would almost be more sad because as far as I'm concerned, nothing kills creativity more than predictability. It's in the unpredictability. It's in the discovery that so much magic happens. I'm going to give an example that when I am making a movie, for example, particularly if I'm directing it, I am going to lay out storyboards. I'm going to do outlines, mood boards, all this stuff gets planned. And I have to, right? Um, Because depending on the project, sometimes there are four, five, six figures writing on one day. If it's not really well planned and a day is lost can literally cost hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes thousands, sometimes tens of thousands, never a good idea. So those plans have to be really, really clear. And a a poorly planned project or a poorly planned day can kill a project. So without the plan, you can pretty easily get lost. But with the plan, you actually have to be amazingly vigilant in making sure that you can adjust in the moment to meet the demands of whatever that situation is. So we're going to go into the first step of the planning, which is going to be SMART goals. Uh, SMART goals are not a new concept. I'm going to go over it briefly. If you're not familiar with them, this could be mind blowing. If you are, it'll be a kind of a nice quick little refresher. So the first step in planning is setting your goal. So what is your goal? What do you want to do? And it's got to be very specific. Let's say I want to direct a short film. So that would not be an actual goal. It's not even a concept. It's an idea. It's a desire. The goal comes when we get a quite a bit more specific to that because everybody wants things. You might want a million dollars. You might want a new car. Just wanting something doesn't, is not in the realm of goals. So when I first moved to LA, uh, I had all these dreams and aspirations of making big movies and winning awards. And you could say winning an Oscar. Well, that's kind of specific. Um, that could be a goal, but no, because uh, that is, you, you can't set that as a goal for a lot of reasons. First of all, I don't have control over when I, whether I win an Oscar or not. I can do a great performance. I can make a, I can write a great screenplay. I can direct a great movie, but great movies get made all the time and people don't win Oscars for them. So that's not a goal. I don't have control over it. It's not within my life. And when I kind of look back on that, I just see how much of my, like what I thought were goals were just, you know, dreams. And in some ways they really became pipe dreams because with, because they weren't clear enough for me to make specific marked progress along that. So 
Eventually, it took me way too long to figure this out, but that I needed to be making SMART goals. So what is a SMART goal? It is specific, it is measurable, it is actionable and achievable by you. It's like something you can actually do. You know, as far as like actionable or achievable, I can't dunk a basketball, just can't do that. So that would be uh, no, certainly not achievable by me. So actionable, I've got to be able to do it. It should be relevant, like relevant to your life. And actually the, like really going back, this ties into the why that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Why do I really want to do this? It's got to be relevant to my life in some ways. And lastly, the T in smart is time-based. You've got to, it's got to have a time, time can, restriction on it. It's got to have a specific place you're going and a time. Once again, doesn't mean that that won't shift. It will, lots will shift along the way. But when we're clear and we set that goal within a, within a time frame, then when the time comes and we realize, oh, we haven't hit it, that's okay. We can readjust or whatever needs to happen. But if we're not aiming there, we're definitely not going to get there. And I found that once I made my SMART goals, I could do them. I got there. I was no longer depending on other people nominating me for award to feel validated in some ways or paying me $100,000 for a screenplay I wrote. That didn't matter anymore um, because I didn't have control over whether or not someone wrote that check. So the goals being in your, you know, within your realm of doing and very clear become something that you can do. So, um, So let's go, let's kind of jump into it. Man, when you're making your smart goals, let's say you want to write a book. I want to write a novel. I hear that quite a bit. I want to write a novel. So again, even if you say, my goal is to write a novel. Again, like not terribly specific. How will you know when it's done? How will you know uh, if you are kind of making progress? Because a novel can be a couple hundred pages. If you've ever read Dostoevsky or, or Tolstoy, you know, the novel could be 900 pages, right? So what, what is that novel? What, like, what is some of the specifics? Just for example, the year that I moved to Kenya, I wanted to launch a blog. And that was great. I had a very specific name. I knew how often I was going to post. I knew how long my posts were going to be. I knew what the topic was. I had all of that. And then you know what? I could actually execute on it because if I was going to post once a week on the blog and my blogs were going to be between 600 and 1,000 words, then I could kind of work my way backwards and to make sure that I hit that. So specifics, S, it's too often we set goals like I want to make a movie and we don't get there because it's just not specific enough. Um, I said I wanted to move to Africa, pretty unspecific. I could have ended up in a war zone, in a jungle, in a national park with gorillas or the middle of a desert. Being very specific helps uh, me get have an amazing experience when I got there because I knew that I wasn't just going to Africa. I was going to a certain part of Kenya. Um, so that was very specific as an example. So M is measurable. Can you measure it? How will you know if you are getting there? So if I put, I will record 25 podcast episodes in a year, I can measure it because either I did or I didn't record 25 podcasts at the end of the year very specific and very measurable. Um, So that's pretty important. Also, the measurable part becomes a little bit easier once you get specific. Because so for example, like I want to, you know, I want to make a lot of money. Okay, uh, fine. But what is a lot of money? Because what's a lot of money in California is very different from what is a lot of money in Kenya. So um, once you get the specific part, the measurable part becomes a little bit easier. And then there is, is it attainable? right? So this one is hard because you want to push yourself, but you also want to be realistic. And at the same time, of course, not too realistic. Um, Because when I first moved to Hollywood, I wanted to sell a script for $100,000. But pretty much no one's like written like on their second script, it happens very, very rarely every once in a while. But for the most part, there are millions of people want to be screenwriters. And you can probably count on one or two hands, anyone that sold one of their first two screenplays for $100,000, just not very common. So, you know, while ultimately, you can say that wasn't attainable, right, that would have been a challenge. So or impossible, in my case, I never did sell a script for $100,000. So, um, Making sure that it's attainable and attainable by you, I think is really, it's, it's an overlooked how important that is because we're also going to go into actionable. It has to be something that you can, that you can act upon 
as well as it being attainable. So it's this place you're going to find out of where do I feel comfortable with pushing my boundaries, but also so that way I'm not out of the realm of being realistic. And this is also when I say sort of uh, attainable and actionable is because it has to be actionable by you, like you have to be able to do it. I could have written myself a $100,000 check and gone and deposit in my very own bank account and they would have like they would have laughed because that is silly. I didn't have $100,000 to pay me. Um, but obviously, if I wrote myself a $100,000 check, I'm still in exactly the same place. No, no big difference. So I couldn't write that check. So therefore, selling a script for $100,000 was definitely not a smart goal because I couldn't act upon it. It also has to be relevant, right? So how does it fit into your life and the vision that you want to have for your life and what you want it to be? Ultimately, as I said, this goes back to the why. Why are you doing this in the first place? So as I mentioned, there was a time when it was really important to me, or I felt like it was important to me to win an Oscar that felt like it was a goal, right? Now, don't be on don't don't get me wrong. Like if if I win an Oscar someday, that would be fantastic. I would absolutely love that. But it's not a goal because having a hardware on my on my mantle is actually not relevant to my life. You know, I'm in my mid forties and I have made it this far pretty happy, pretty fulfilled without hardware on my mantle. So it's not actually relevant to my life to win an Oscar. I feel good for my ego, not relevant to my life, not relevant to why I'm showing up and doing the work that I'm doing. Um, and then I mentioned time base, really, really important, not next fall, but October 1st right? For example, this is just really, really important. You know, six to nine months is an ideal amount of time. It can be up to a year, but shouldn't be more than that. If your goal is something that is going to take you 10 years, then you've probably, you, you're, you made it too big. What is the goal you can do within one year? So let's say uh, how to make a murderer, I think is, was the, the show on Netflix and they filmed for 10 years. But they could not have set that as a goal. In fact, they had no way of knowing that that was where this, that project was going to go. You know, it was like, oh, we're going to go film this thing and make this little documentary. And then, oh my gosh, something new happens, something new happens, something new happens. And it kept changing. But if they had set that as a goal in 10 years, we're going to deliver this series and win. I forget if they won an Emmy or an Oscar or whatever. But if they had made that choice, they, I don't think they ever would have gotten there. But they had a goal that was much smaller. I'm going to do this thing within the year. And then at the end of the year, it's like, oh, something new's come up. Well, we're going to push the goal. We're going to alter that and do it again. We're going to keep making those changes. And eventually they, you know, uh, had an enormously successful series. So once again, um, you know, here it's also easy to avoid being specific in our time-based portion, because if we don't give it a time frame, we can't fail. Can't succeed either, but you can't fail. <laughs> And if you don't, if you're worried about failing, then making it time-based is pretty scary. But if you're worried about not succeeding, then this becomes really, really important. Give it a time frame. You can always shift it. You can do whatever you need, but you know, you don't, not that you want to give yourself an excuse so you can keep getting out of it. But once again, you know, uh, if whatever you're going to do and you give it a time, you know, time, either you get to October 1st and you finish this project or you didn't. And if you didn't, you may be a little bit disappointed with yourself. And that's a hard thing to, to swallow. So better just say, someday I'm going to do this, or I'm going to, I'm, yeah, I'm starting to work on my novel and you may never get there. Give it a time frame within a year. So now it's time to make your own SMART goal. In the show notes, there will be a worksheet that you can download and either print out or fill it in online. So we'll go over some of what those questions are to kind of set you up. Pretty simple, or you just like find a good place to write. You don't even need the sheet. You'll write it on a piece of paper, um, write it in your journal, type it on your computer, whatever that's going to be. So now just remember, it has to be realistic and attainable. Again, if you're a single mother and you have a full-time job, you're not going to be writing for two hours every day. It's just not realistic, it's not possible. So that becomes really important. Like, where are you at? If you have a job, if you have a corporate job and you have a family and you know that your corporate job comes first because you're paying the bills and you're doing all these things, then how do you fit that into your life? If you're, you know, if you have a part-time job and you've got, you know, 20 hours a week to dedicate it to it, then now you could like you're gonna have a different you're gonna have a different goal something different will be attainable 
and really realistic within what your situation is. So once you've written this down, put it someplace where you'll see it regularly. I love like printing it out and putting it on the wall. You know, sometimes if I'm like right now that my screensaver on my computer is my, my intentions and my goals for 2022, that's a place where I can, you know, see it regularly. So every time I open up my computer, there it is kind of looking at me really good. But for this particular process or project, and if you don't have a printer, go to Staples, you know, do it at work, something Print it out, hang it on your wall where you can look at it, where you can see it every day and where it's kind of looking back at you. So an example of your SMART goal, once again, very specific. So here I wrote um, one, which was, uh, I will write and publish the Creatives Handbook, a 10,000 word manuscript on how to develop a practice for powerful and effective creating. And I will have a final draft by July 1st, or I said on July 1st, not by on. That gave me a very specific. It wasn't going to be, oh, uh, June 1st, I'm done. No, if I, if I had finished something else, I could set it back down and I could come back and give it a, you know, give it a look or whatever. So it's very specific in that way too. In this case, I went on and wrote, and this isn't really a part of the, the goal, but you know, I will, uh, write 400 words per day, five days a week, and at least 45 minutes on each of those days because sometimes I was re-editing, and so maybe I didn't do 400 words, but I did 45 minutes. So that kind of came a little bit later in my milestones, but that would be it. So then next, we can go on to the milestones question, um, because one of the great killers of powerful and effective creating is not being able to measure your progress. So if you can't measure it, you don't know if you're getting there. And sometimes actually you're a lot closer than you think. And sometimes it's the other way around. So writing down these milestones are incredibly important. And um, this was kind of fun, actually. So a few years ago, I was well, many years ago now, over a decade, I was pretty much ready to quit the film industry. I'd been working really hard and felt like I'm just not making progress. I'm not getting anywhere. I'm busting my butt and nobody cares and I'm still broke and and then I went to organize my portfolio just so I could clean out my hard drive and move on with my life. And I was surprised that I had nearly a dozen projects over the year and a half that I thought I wasn't getting anywhere. I had two feature films uh, I'd, uh, that I had produced. I had uh, directed and um, worked on a couple of music videos, short films, commercials. So... Here was the thing. I had these goals of like being rich and making movies, but I wasn't specific and I did not give myself milestones to be able to refer back to. So basically I thought that I was completely failing at what I had come to Los Angeles for. And then I looked and I was like, okay, well, I didn't have a lot of money, but, uh, cause some of those projects were my, the luckiest man alive, which was my first short film as a director. It cost me money to do it. But if I had known that, like I'm saying, I just want to make as, you know, I want to make, and I was really specific, uh, and I had given myself uh, milestones, then I would know I'm actually making a lot of headway. And it's what, you know, sort of revitalized me and gave me, you know, at that point, you know, another decade of living in Hollywood and and actually getting a lot of success success after that because I had this awakening of, oh my gosh, I'm actually succeeding. I just didn't know. So that's the good side of measuring, seeing what you have done that you, and so you can see, wow, I've come this far. Of course, there's the other side of that, which is in other projects or in other areas of life. Um, I didn't hit them. I didn't, well, and so then it was just disappointing to go and see how I had these milestones and I didn't hit them. So measuring your progress is definitely not there to make you feel bad when you don't accomplish what you set out to do, because sometimes you have to actually set the wrong ones. So that way you can find what the right ones are, right? Sometimes you may have been too ambitious, uh, real life emergencies pop up, uh, all sorts of things can happen. You also might not have been ambitious enough, in which case you lost momentum. You know, there was a little bit of just like lethargy because it became a little bit too predictable um, to be able to get there. So you know, that can also be, you know, that can, that can definitely be a challenge. And this was actually a little quote that I found from Gretchen Rubin that I think is really important. And she said, if you want something to count in your life, it helps to figure out a way to count it. You can manage what you measure. Pretty simple. I think it's really, really important. So uh, setting milestones, there are two types of milestones and these sheets will be down below and these are really important. 
because the first one is your weekly, weekly milestones and your second is the major milestones. Now, once you write these down, you put them in your calendar. Um, I mean, one of the things about having a smartphone is that you have that at your fingertips, put it in, you know, if on the first of next month, you're going to, you know, have a, hit a certain milestone, put it in your calendar. If you're old school and you have your calendar on the wall, put it on the wall and you write it in. Then there's also your weekly milestones. So weekly milestones might look something like this. Week one, I'm going to write 2000 words a day. That would be, you know, 400 words a day, five days a week. Um, you know, and the same kind of thing, say for the next four weeks, that's 8,000 words in a month. Then you can kind of say, okay, well in a month, now I know in a month, if I'm really going to stick to that, maybe give yourself a little leeway. That would be 8,000 words. Let's say, I'm going to say 6,000 words, right? Is going to be something that I can put in, you know, I'm going to, and what does that equate to? I'm going to have, you know, three chapters of my book written, or I'm going to, however it's going to be, I'm going to have a, you know, a complete outline of my documentary project or whatever that is. So that's the weekly ones. The larger ones, and you're going to find that you're going to move these things around for sure, because your larger ones, your goal ultimately helps you figure out what are the major milestones I have to hit in order to reach my goal. And then if I'm going to hit those major milestones, like by the first of next month, I'm going to have X numbers of pages or, or X number of audio hours recorded for my podcast or X number of, of, you know, interviews recorded for my documentary. Um, you know, you can kind of like, what do I have to do every week in order to get there? So it's a little bit of this kind of backwards thing where you go, your big goal, your, your, like what you think you can do every week, then you figure out, or every month, then you figure out what your major milestones are, and then you fix your weekly mile or your weekly milestones in order to meet those. So the major milestones might look like this. Uh, let's say if you're making a documentary, it might be August 1st, final proposal and treatment. September 1st, I uh, have my camera and have set up my first three interviews. October 1st, have recorded the first three interviews. Um, November 1st, revise the story, because if you're filming a documentary, you will revise your story, uh, or you need to make some changes, um, and shoot, you know, on five more days. On December 1st, I want to have a first assembly. On, you know, January 15th, do a screening for some friends and family and get some notes, uh, shoot additional footage on March, April, final cut, June color correction and sound mix, July 1st complete. There we go. I got my documentary in a year. Uh, it can be something like that for writing a book. Uh, August 1st, I'm going to have my first 10,000 words. Then I'm going to have 20,000 words on October 1st. And November 1st, I will have 30. And uh, December 1st, I will have my, you know, my first, you know, rough, rough, rough draft. And then again, you know, January 1st, second draft and send the book to two readers on that date. Um, you know, and then a month later, begin the third draft and a month later that, you know, send my next draft to two other readers, uh, do a table read a month after that, and et cetera. So you get the idea. So that's kind of the piece. And then, um, once you have that, again, all of those pieces need to go on your calendar. Um, that's really, really important. And I can't, I can't, um, emphasize enough just how important that is. Um, and remember all of these are working documents. So it's not like once I say, I'm going to do this, then you can't ever not do that. You are a human being. You have a life. You may get sick. Your kid might get sick. Something at work is going to happen, like whatever it is. And I think, and we'll talk about this more a little bit later in the series, but um, when you don't hit a goal or a milestone, the thing is not to judge it, but to learn from it. You are not a failure. You just recommit to your process. You make the adjustments, not hitting it. You're not a failure. You are a human being and human beings have human things that come up. And that's just really, really important. But if you don't learn from it, then it can definitely become a failure over time, right? He's like, I wanted to do this thing 20 years ago and I still never done it. And why haven't I done it? Well, because there were certain habits and patterns that were keeping me from doing it and others that would have supported me that I wasn't making those changes in order to do. So learning from it. And even like way too often, I hear people say something like, oh, if only I would like learned how to do this 10 years ago. But that's 10 years ago. That's not today. Now you can be in, uh, 
You can be impinging upon your creative possibility and your creative output today because you are feeling bad about not having learned whatever lessons you needed to earlier. And that's just completely uh, counterproductive, to be quite honest, right? All of it is part of the process. So every failure that you have, every missed opportunity is just as much a part of the process as the successful moments or the things that make you feel really great in the moment. Very often, the reality is that when you win an Oscar, it feels great. You finished your book, it feels great. You secured a publishing deal, that feels great. That great feeling tends to last pretty short because now it's like, okay, I won an Oscar, but at some point I got to get up in the morning and I got to start working on my next movie. You win a Grammy, I got to start working on my next album, right? So that is just kind of a, a stepping stone, but also the missed opportunities or the failures are the same thing. Like learn from it and get up and do the next album, whatever happened. Now, once again, you know, the last thing I want to say about this is this may iterate. So you may need to change this. You might realize I wanted to write 400 words a day, uh, five days a week, and I just simply can't do that. And that's okay. You alter it, you adjust it. You know, and I think one of the things is that when, when we decide we're going to take on a creative project, very often it's, we think like, I need to alter my life in order to make this happen. But that's not quite actually the best way to go about it. The best way to go about it is not, I am, you know, uplifting, I, I'm like, I am uprooting everything in order to do this. Instead, it's, we're going to work on how do we get our creative life to fit fully and realistically and fulfilling into the life that we have. So with that, have a beautiful couple of weeks working on planning the ways in which you are going to get your creative dreams happening. See you next time. Tapping Creativity is brought to you in part by We Strive a nonprofit organization that works to lead the world towards stronger, healthier, and more sustainable community. We Strive is currently at an exciting juncture in that coming out of the pandemic, it is in a place of looking to see how can it now, as a established organization, be of greatest support to the creative communities as well as communities who are striving in any way they know how to engage in co-creating a better world. If you're interested in learning more, visit WeStrive.org.